Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this evening's Living Legacy Project program on Dorothy Foreman Cotton, one of the unsung heroes of the civil rights movement. I'm Annette Marquis, Director of Operations for the Living Legacy Project. Our organization conducts pilgrimages to important sites of the American civil rights movement, providing experiential learning opportunities to deepen understanding of the movement by visiting the sites where it happened, talking with people who lived it, and exploring what these stories teach us about the work that still needs to be done. We're especially happy to share stories of Dorothy Cotton with you tonight. I had the privilege of meeting Dr. Cotton when the Living Legacy Project hosted a conference for Unitarian Universalist veterans of the civil rights movement. Her wisdom and grace left a lasting impression on me. Tonight's program features a distinguished panel of presenters who knew Dorothy Cotton personally and are committed to carrying out her vision in the world. Last week, many of you joined us for a screening of the incredible documentary, Move When the Spirit Says Move, the legacy of Dorothy Foreman Cotton. You saw the speakers we have with us tonight in that film speaking about their friend and leader. We're so grateful they're here with us in person tonight. Our moderator is Dr. Charlene Sinclair, a consultant, trainer, and strategic advisor for leading social change organizations. Her commitment to racial justice is inspired by people like Dorothy Cotton, who believed in racial justice and nonviolence not as a strategy, but as a way of being in the world. The program will last about an hour. And afterwards, you're invited to join us in a Zoom meeting to ask questions and engage in a more relaxed conversation with our guests. The link will be provided in the chat by Pam Zappardino, a member of the LLP board and our chat manager this evening. You can also find the link in the email you received about the program earlier today or when you registered. Now, please join me in welcoming Dr. Charlene Sinclair who will introduce our other guests. Jeanette, I am so delighted to be here. So delighted to share this space with all of you as well as with our guests. And I loved your framing around the work. We're going to call this our virtual pilgrimage, where we will sit down and engage Dorothy Cotton and these amazing um, justice warriors that knew Dorothy uh, personally. I am so delighted that we are joined first by Ms. Laura Branca. Laura is a co-founder and senior fellow of the Dorothy Cotton Institute. As Dorothy Cotton Institute's project director, Laura has worked to secure the major funding and donations to fulfill the DCI's role as the executive producer of this amazing documentary. Laura met Dorothy Cotton at Cornell in 1985, and help design and facilitate DCI's human rights and citizenship education workshops. She has 37 years experience as an organizational development trainer and consultant and has designed and led numerous workshops and intensives on anti-oppression and the dynamics of systems of exclusion, cultural competence, DEI, conflict resolution, effective communication and leadership development. Laura, welcome, and thank you again for always saying yes when we we come to you to say, can we talk about Dorothy? So thank you so very much for that. We are also joined by Mrs. Aljosi Aldrich Hardy, who has been a steadfast advocate for nonviolent social justice organizing and activism for over half a century. Yes, she is gorgeous and uh, she absolutely doesn't look as though she spent that much time on earth. She has tirelessly created and led intergenerational empowerment building circles and workshops in the United States and abroad. As a spiritual guide, she grounds her work in healing justice principles and practices nurturing the growth of communities and individuals. And since officially retiring as a librarian and teacher, Aljosi has continued her passionate commitment to social justice as a pollinator, an organizer, an educator. 
Her work is deeply rooted in healing justice practices and principles, which she incorporates as a spiritual guide and director. Her dedication is matched only by her love of jazz music, travel, and walks with nature. And she is not only a pollinator, but a cultivator of a variety of relationships with organizations and universities around the world, including, I'm going to get this wrong, Bruderhof. Did I get that right? Bruderhof. Bruderhof. Bruderhof Soka Gakai. Ah, look at me, Soka Gakai International, Young Adult Quakers, of course, the Dorothy Cotton Institute, Duke University, Kennesaw State University, and Yale National University of Singapore. But her principal organizational work is related to the National Council of Elders, Project South, and the Dorothy Cotton Institute. Welcome so much, Ms. Al Josie. It's wonderful to have you. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. Thank you. And we are also joined by Dr. Claiborne Carson. Dr. Carson is the Stanford Professor Emeritus, a close friend of Dorothy and the founder of Stanford's MLK Junior Research and Education Institute. Dr. Carlson is an American academic who was a professor of history at Stanford University and director of the Martin Luther King Jr. Research and Education Institute. And since 1985, he has directed the Martin Luther King Papers Project, a long-term project to edit and publish the papers of Martin Luther King Jr. And if we were in person, I'd have you sign one of those books that are on my bookshelf. Thank you. You are all treasures. And I deeply appreciate you being here. Dr. Carson, we would like to begin with you. Um, and we'd like to talk a bit about Dorothy's role within the SELC. One of the things that you mentioned within the, the film itself was how inspiring uh, Dorothy was, this inspiration that she brought into so many spaces and the resoluteness in which she waged this battle. I want to think about how she as a woman within that space, within that moment, navigated um, not only the justice movement, but even navigated that space. Can you give us a little insight into that moment? Well, I think the best way I would put it is that she was always an educator, that she always felt that part of her role was to educate people about the movement and about the best way of making it effective. Um, I, I remember her as somebody who was always, um, always ready to teach, even if teaching meant singing. Uh, it, it could mean any number of different things. And um, and I know that the years that she spent out here in California uh, was were great for the people who worked on, on the King Papers Project. Um, some of you might know that a lot of her book was written upstairs in, in the house I'm living in right now. And uh, we would come down and, and uh, read a chapter and go over it and and but she would also be teaching us about the movement and um and i think that 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 was always her 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 main contribution and i and i think it's something that's often forgotten uh in the civil rights movement that there had to be a lot of the insight for both SNCC and sclc came out of Obviously, Highlander out of the the um, schools that had already existed before that, um, and she was building on that long legacy of of people teaching, and uh, and another way of thinking of of teaching is teaching people freedom, teaching people how to uh, free themselves. You know, the worst kind of enslavement is ignorance. And uh, and, and so for, literacy was always part of it, uh, but also learning your rights was also part of it. And all, all the essential things that make a movement possible, you know, I presume that there's a teacher there ready to, uh, to take on that role. 
Thank you. Laura, can you pick up this thread? You know, you talked a bit about the citizenship schools, and I know that in Dorothy's legacy, you are so adamant about, you know, making sure that discussion, real education, real engagement happens, even with this film. So can you pick up on that thread and talk about Dorothy's role with the citizenship school? Well, it's it's uh, it's kind of funny, Charlene, because uh, when we were in the first stages of forming the Dorothy Cotton Institute, we knew that the citizenship education program was something very powerful, but there were no agendas. There was no manual. There were no steps of what you did on day one, day two. We interviewed Dorothy and we would be saying, okay, that I wrote it all down. That's great. We recorded it. And but what happened on day three? Well, Dr. King would come in on day three and he would teach about nonviolence and the steps of a nonviolent campaign. And by day five, people would leave with a with a, a plan of action to go back to their community and they would become teachers themselves. They would, they would teach what they had learned and they would just turn it over. But it's it's fantastic to think that within a five-day intensive, people could go from some of them being functionally illiterate, semi-literate, and not knowing what's in the Constitution, to walking out with a plan of action and going back and starting their own citizenship schools. So there was something very, very um, practical as well as very inspiring. And I think that what made it so relevant and so um, um, meaningful was that people were thirsty. People were hungry. They had been trying to register to vote many times. People who were actually well-educated folks who went to the went to register eight times and got got rejected because of the the ridiculous um, tests that they were subjected to that no one could answer how many bubbles in a bar of soap, you know, things like that. So she was able with her, her, she was a very charismatic person and a very persuasive person. And her methodology was to find out what people really needed to learn in order to feel like they were equipped to have more agency in their lives. And there was a process that moved people from a victim mindset. Oh, poor me, I'm being oppressed. It's dangerous. It's the, the, threatening us all the time. That was no joke. It wasn't a made up story. But how do you move from a mindset where you are accepting that violence is normal and that you just have to somehow avoid being in the way of it and learn how to navigate being in the uh, vicinity of white folks who will take advantage of you or who want to hurt you? How do you, how do you manage that without simply being caving into it. And by somehow, in the space of five days, people left with a change in consciousness, as well as the challenge to, yes, be be angry because it motivates you to change. It's important to see injustice and be angry about it, but to not let that mm -hmm drive your behavior or destroy your heart and your humanity. And that's where the nonviolence came in. So her process was one of inquiry, asking thought provoking questions. It's in, the, it's in the movie where one of the things Dorothy would tell us often when she was dealing with someone who was just full of bitterness, like complaints about how badly they get treated, uh, by the county clerk, and she'd say, well, why aren't you the county clerk? And, well, <laughs> it's lots of reasons why, but that kind of question would cause people to step back and say, yeah, what's going on here? How did we get in this predicament? Who's making these decisions? Who's allowing somebody who's that abusive and, and offensive to have this kind of significant role in helping people get the right to vote, get their get their registration. She would make you think, and she was a genius at that. We saw it in action lots of times. She would just stop us and then 
ask a very thought-provoking question that would really take the conversation someplace else and would lead you to what you want to do about the situation, not just how bad it is, but okay, what is what are the options here? And by working that in a group of people who had similar, but similar, similar um, injury and similar fears and similar um, confusion about yeah. what they could do, that process of hearing from one another's stories was one of the one of the ways that people were nourished. Mm -hmm. It's happening in lots of places, but some people are doing different things that I haven't tried. Let me see if I could try that. So you would leave with an array of strategies, and then you could try things out, and people would critique it and say, well, that might not work, because when I tried that, this is what happened. So there was a group process of, of learning together and we try to incorporate that in what we do, because that's that's where the the the, uh, the relevance comes. Not just being at the effect of people who are smarter and more knowledgeable than you, mm -hmm. and trying to remember what they said, but actually accessing what you know. Yeah, working with what you have. I think and that is how so to do that change nonviolently. That was the yeah. other piece, and we'll talk more about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I do want to talk more about that, but I want to really. Um, push it a little bit further, um, Ms. Al Josie, around this provocation piece, this this woman that came with, when I, I saw the film, I I consider myself in, in the lineage of Dorothy Cotton, you know, as a Black woman, change maker, organizer, who believes in, in you know, really giving people like a rigorous, knowledge, but in a way that have them see themselves in it, not banking towards them, but as a participant in building our own meaning. So Ms. Aljosi, one of the things that I appreciated was the strength, like the, the, the warmth that came with this, this bold, courageous, prov provocative strength. And so I, I'm curious about, you know, how, how did she hold on to that in such an interesting way to hold all of those pieces together? Well, Charlene, I, I don't know that I can give you an in-depth answer to that. I'd like to say that a lot of that was Dorothy's personality. And I think I always thought I shared something in common with Dorothy in that early on, we thought we were misfits, that we thought we didn't belong where we were in North Carolina. And I'm from North Carolina, too. So Dorothy says in the film that she thought she was supposed to leave and do some other things. And so I think she had a strong sense of how she wanted to be, how she wanted to create herself, what strengths she had that she wanted to increase and what kinds of things she wanted to leave behind. And I think early on, she saw herself as someone who would be a leader, someone who would share she grew a lot from the hardships of her life. As you'll recall in the film, her mother died early when she was about three and she had to develop certain strengths. And I liked when I helped to show this to young people to talk about that, developing strengths and going inside and thinking about who you are and who you want to be. And Dorothy was excellent with that. And I think throughout her life, she continued to grow. And she saw herself as a person who could work with Dr. King, as she said, but not for Dr. King. So she saw herself always as a, an equal human being who had strengths, who had ideas, and who had the right to bring those strengths and ideas forward, even though she was born in Goldsboro, North Carolina. That didn't limit her. It, I don't think anything could have limited uh, Ms. Cotton. You know, I mean, literally her her energy just leapt off of that screen. I was left saying, God, I wish I could have sat at her feet. And, uh, you know, and I know organizers who had that privilege. Uh, Dr. Carson, can you talk to us? You, you know, you have a personal relationship. You've done so much of this historic work as well. And uh, I one of the things that Dorothy talked about was, the movement as family, you know, so in addition to 
strategy and tactic and all, you know, it was the creation of a sense of we're all in this together. Yeah, and I, I tend to feel that so much of that is missing these days. I'm curious about what your thoughts are around that. Well, I, I think, first of all, I, I, I must admit, I feel a little bit uncomfortable talking with other people who have known her as long as I have, or sometimes longer, um, because you could all, almost have three or four books about Dorothy Cotton, and all of them would be true, and all of them would be different. You know, when she was out here, uh, first of all, just a little correction on, on I was at the King Papers Project when she arrived, but um, I retired. And and one of the things that um, I think I remember about her life is that the parts of it that were not even in the South. Um, when she went with us, and Laurel, you probably remember this, uh, to, to Israel and Palestine, she was still teaching. She was still being a leader of the group. She was still the one who uh, everybody would kind of see her as not just a teacher, but somebody they want to have in their home and talking to the young people. And, and of course, with that voice of hers, you know, being able to, to uh, pick up Palestinian songs as well as English songs. And, and uh, you know, those are the kinds of things that, I remember, and and because they were so, you know, you could not have predicted how someone from that background might respond to being in a foreign country. But uh, she was definitely the star of the show. You know, she was the one who kind of um, everyone related to. Every, everyone saw her as friendly, open. Um, I I love taking pictures. I probably have more pictures of her than practically anybody in, in the movement. And uh, and it's because, well, first of all, because she's beautiful, but it's also because she is has so many faces that you can see, and uh, uh, depending on what she, she happens to be doing. So I, I, I really think that one thing I, I would say is that if you had to have one person to teach you all of the different elements of the movement, you know, not just the you know, Martin Luther King getting up and giving a speech, but you know, all the stuff that is usually hidden in the background. And you you needed to have somebody tell that story. You know, without that, the movement wouldn't have been a movement. And she's she's the one who um, really did that, and. And and I think her connection with education, of course, goes goes beyond. You know, she was working at a college um, before she joined SCLC. Um, I think from the very beginning, she saw that as the avenue um, to to take in terms of moving forward the movement. And um, and you know, to me, she was another thing about her was she was funny, fun fun to be around, uh, wonderful to take out to a restaurant. Uh, she was always the center. If she didn't, she could walk into the restaurant, no one would know her. By the end of the meal, everyone would know her better than they knew everybody else. That says something about her. And Clay, I'd oh, like to wow. mention her vulnerability, her openness, her tender heart. Uh, because yes. you probably recall when we were in Palestine, the tears that would come to her eyes as she as she looked at the walls or we were walking the fields and we saw uh, various indications that there had been uh, tear gas or there had been other kinds of uh, agents of war used there. And their poignant scene, a poignant scene of her and Vincent walking and, and looking down with tears in their eyes. She had such a sympathy and such a love for people and could feel deeply the pain of other people. Yeah. You know, um, I don't know if you were there that night when 
a lot of the kids got together and she was kind of the leader of uh, all of them singing the songs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, she was learning songs, teaching songs. Uh, it, was, it was a beautiful time to be around it. But speaking of the, the tear gas, I, I remember her being in one of those marches that ended in tear gas. And, um, you know, so she, she was pretty brave to, to be there and take that role. And, uh, and I know a lot of those young people probably remember her to this day. Laura, jump in, because I know this was one of the stories that that you had mentioned. Talk to us a little bit about that time. The trip to Palestine? Yes. Oh, well, uh, one of our colleagues, uh, uh, Dr. Margot Hittleman, at her uh, congregation with her rabbi, Rabbi Brian Walt, they were talking together about wanting to um, visit and see what was going on in the West Bank. And Margot brought that to us at the at, at Dorothy Cotton Institute and said, well, you know, what do you think about taking a bunch of us there? And Dorothy was into it. Her friends were not so into it. They were like, I don't think you should do that. I mean, sure you want to go and, you know, Maybe the, the the notion was going to the Middle East is dangerous and it's too risky for you. But um she didn't she didn't show fear. She she was distressed about people not really getting why she wanted to go, but she didn't that didn't dissuade her from going. We had an incredible delegation, 23 people, uh 13 African American scholars, historians, peacemakers, uh ministers. Uh, we had, I think, three or four rabbis and, uh, you know, another three or four ministers and doc two doctors. It was and people ranging from the age of 30 to 83. And so it was it was really something. It was intergenerational. It was interracial. It was interfaith. And um, it was an extraordinary group. And what I want to say about that trip is that when you get there, you immediately see that this is a party. That it, you really can't ignore it. Um, we were we stayed in East Jerusalem, and then we made our way into the West Bank of uh, cities and villages, and just going trying to trying to travel, trying to get through those checkpoints. Um, the hostility uh, of the people who are enforcing those rules is really very palpable. And a little bit scary, but we didn't we didn't get turned away. Um, but it was a, it wasn't just going and seeing that people were suffering. It was actually experiencing the incredible inconvenience and insult of not being able to have mobility, the freedom to just travel around. You have relatives in another city, and you've got to wait for a permit to get there. And it, it's not easy to live that way or people's water being people being deprived of being able to access their water wells going from having a wonderful spring that was right in your village to, to then having um the uh settlements being able to access your water and you get it only one day a week for seven hours you know lots and lots of sort of insulting things like that that also were impacting us emotionally and Dorothy for, for sure. Um, but she went as a listener. And mm -hmm. I think that's an important thing. She didn't think she was that we were going to go and tell people how to do the movement. This is what we did. And this is how you ought to do it. You get there and you see these quotes from Martin Luther King and you got pictures of Bob Marley and you got pictures of Malcolm X and you've got, the evidence of how much the Palestinians, at least in the West Bank, honor and study the work of the Black freedom struggle and the uh, the liberation uh, uh, writings of some of our leaders and how meaningful it was for them to be visited in person by this group of outstanding people, mm -hmm. including my, my dear friends here, Clay and Mel Josie. So Dorothy was... I think she was she was mm, uncertain about how to relate to st through the rock stone the, the the rock throwing 
in the in the Middle East in in Palestine, a lot of the young people have slingshots, and when the when the IDF comes into your your village, or you know, you're ha trying to have a peaceful march, and they're coming in, and, you know, the young people take to the hills, and they're they're slinging small stones at armored vehicles. But even that level of fighting back troubled Dorothy. She wasn't sure what to think about that. Is that nonviolence? Because they're unarmed, but they're kind of still fighting. And you know, so we had conversations about that, which is important to me because it made me have to think, it made us all have to sort of reflect on what are we seeing? Where do we stand about it? Um, what do we support? What do we not support? And that's an ongoing process, even to today, when there's so much misinformation and differing information. So she was mm -hmm. she was very committed to nonviolence. She was very, I would say, a tender-hearted person who could feel the suffering of other people and uh, the injustice of how they were being forced to live. And also, uh, really, as Clay was describing, very, very good at just making personal connections with people, getting to know mm -hmm. people, listening to people, listening to their stories. And that's what people wanted us to do, come back and tell their stories. Not, right. to, not to analyze it, not to preach about it, just tell people what you saw. And mm -hmm. so that's what we, we tried to do. It also, yeah. I, I want to say something about nonviolence. And Clay, you're right. She did experience the tear gas when she was in Vietnam. Oh boy, you hear in the movie Bernard Lafayette talking about the uh, the student the students who were organizing to try to get rid of the U.S. troops, and you know confronting the troops at the embassy. And then they they the the demonstration was met with tear gas. There was Dorothy right there, <laughs> right there mm -hmm. encountering the troops. And her her statement to us was. If you if you experience tear gas, you will run. That was mm -hmm. it. Like, make no doubt about it. You're not going to stand there. You're gonna you're gonna you're gonna be so overcome by it that you will run. But um, yeah, she she experienced all of those things that we see in the newsreels. She was right there in the middle of it, and it's a side of Dorothy that I never got to know because. I met her when she was in her 50s. And so she was already sort of done with the active part of the civil rights movement at that point. She was an administrator at Cornell. But um, she often brought up the issue of how much action should we be taking? She was a news junkie and she cared deeply about oppression all over the world. And she felt like we should be doing something about that. So right. I don't know if I answered any question that you asked me, but. <laughs> no, I think that, you know, I really appreciate all that you said. And, mm -hmm. it, it, you know, I want to just sit with this piece around nonviolence a bit more because, you know, I, I've now seen the documentary four, four times. And the piece that catches my heart every time is when Dorothy talks about the bus is pulling away and she and Andy Young saying, this may be the last time. Yeah. And so it was always, violence was always present and swirling. And, um, and but there was just this, this, this pathos, you know, when she talked about that moment. And so Al Josie, I just, you know, would love to just hear even how, you struggle through that and what those conversations may be. Were there times that you all was like, man, this nonviolence thing, man, I don't know. So I, I'm just curious. It's uh, always a struggle. Uh, nonviolence is a struggle. You can believe in nonviolence, but the practice of nonviolence can be a lot more difficult. But practically, you know that you really don't have a choice in terms of we have we don't have the weaponry. And anyway, most of us who, who support nonviolence know that in the end, you will not win by using the tools of the oppressor. 
but nonviolence recall re, the practice of nonviolence requires you to go deep inside and to find some kind of ability to carry on even when you don't know what the outcome is going to be to carry on to believe that there is this sense of we are all brothers and sisters, even though there are a lot of us that we're told to love. We, we, we might love them in our hearts, but we certainly might not like them in terms of who they are and what they do. Nonviolence, the practice of nonviolence, uh, I think forces you to have some kind of inner spiritual grounding not religious grounding, certainly not organized religious grounding, but some kind of faith. Uh, I go back to what was the motto of SCLC, was to save the soul of America, or say, I believe something similar to that, that that is the whole, the internal part of nonviolence is to hold on to this. We are all human beings. We are all the creations of God. And to practice something, I just know not at all reflecting on what Dorothy's practice was. I never had that opportunity to ask her deeply what was her practice. But I know that you have to have some kind of practice, whether it's uh, meditating or praying or writing in your journal or walking in nature. I'm sure part of Dorothy's was singing. I'm sure that was a large part because uh, I've been through periods where those songs, listening to those songs guide my feet. Uh, and so many of those other songs would get you from fear, would get you from deep anger to help you to be able to carry on. Um, so this whole practice of nonviolence uh, is hard work. It is definitely a practice. It is not an easy thing, but I truly believe that it is really what we have to do. We have little alternative in terms of how to make change in this world. Mm. Could I, I appreciate that? Yes, please go for it. I think yesterday was the anniversary of the uh, famous scene in Tiananmen Square where the tanks were rolling and uh, killed that young demonstrator. And um, that's the, this iconic video. Um, to do something like that and to be committed to nonviolence takes a lot of guts, maybe more than I have. And the kind of nonviolence that Dorothy shared with us, we get to see her practicing in her meditations or her prayers, but the satyagraha, which means persistent adherence to the truth. Mm -hmm. uh, and that when you're armed with the truth, when you're equipped with what you believe is really so, that you don't have to resort to force and hurting another human being, that you're strong in what you know and what you believe. And that requires you to have compassion for other human beings. It requires you to be in touch with your own humanity and their humanity. So compassion, empathy, persistent adherence to the truth, and that requires self-sacrifice which is what you're talking about, Al Josie. That discipline, that self-discipline is also sometimes just not lashing out when you really want to hurt somebody, but somehow being able to find another way of holding on to your integrity without turning to the means that they're using. And the quote, Charlene, that you asked me to remember, uh, Dorothy said often, and she says it in the in the film, when you have a clear purpose and clear goals, the, the outcome is pre-existent in the means that we use to get there. So you need to really think about how you're going to get that goal met. And if you want peace, 
you can't get it through hurting and harming and you know stomping on other people. It's not going to work. And that's what Al Josie, you were saying. The tools of the master will never dismantle the master's house. You know, mm-hmm. so that that was something she really lived. She mm-hmm. said it a lot. And I think she really was very conscious about what are the means that people are using, even when their cause is just, are they using means that will actually embody the world that they're trying to create? How do we create the beloved community? Yeah, I appreciate oh, that. And we're getting to the no beloved tactic. community, yes. Charlene. Go mm-hmm. for it. I I see. Go up. Well, the whole thing is that it's not an individual practice. It's not an individual change, but that our goal is to create beloved community and in our own, in our relationships with one another. And I wanted to add to to what Laura was saying is that um, we may not, we have to find the strength to live in this world and realize that we may not see the results of our efforts. We yeah. have to, as they say, we have to be willing to plant the seed and not sit under the tree. We have to be able to do the work in the sense of what is necessary to live in the time that we live. Yes, to bring strength from the ancestors, to gather a lot of strength and energy in those who have gone before us. Um, but to be able to do that work that is this work, each generation must do its own work and be able to find some peace, some ability to do that without having to see all of the results that we're working toward. Mm-hmm. I, I, I think come on, y'all, just go for it. Just shut me up and keep another, going, because this is I'm just excited about this I conversation. Think another thing I would add to what Al Josie just uh, just said is I think I think that Dorothy Cotton, one of the things about her is that She's identified with the civil rights movement, but so many people think of the civil rights movement as something that happened years ago. You know, mm-hmm. back, back back in the 50s and 60s, there was this thing called the civil rights movement. And I think that she's a reminder that it didn't end. You know, Martin Luther King was assassinated in 1968, but the movement didn't end. Mm-hmm. Uh, he himself said, his last book talked about the world house mm-hmm. and he has been part of building the world house she and that's that's where we get our name for, of the project that we're working on you know that is just as alive today as it ever has been in fact probably even more alive you know i i remember seeing an article about Israel and the Palestinian territories, and the title was the Forever War. Mm-hmm. And there's a lot of forever wars going on. Mm-hmm. And I think the the idea behind human rights, which she would understand, is that that was just one stage. That was that was not the same as human rights. Mm-hmm. Uh, human rights are something that don't change because you cross the border. Mm-hmm. They don't change because you happen to be living in the wrong state. Mm-hmm. You know, all of these things were, you know, that they, they belong to human beings, not to countries. Mm-hmm. And and I think that that's where we are today, is we're still at the early stages of probably a much longer struggle. But uh, she she I think was was part of that, and that's that's why she was willing to go to the West Bank. That's why she was willing to go to so many other places that were that were dangerous. Um, in fact, I, I remember that um, Bernard Lafayette once told me that uh, the last conversation we had with Martin Luther King was internationalize the struggle. Mm-hmm. And uh, he's tried to do that. Other people have tried to do that. But other, for so many other people, it's something, oh, you're talking about history. Yeah. It's not history. It, it's still something that is going on. And I think what, the more we recognize that, the more we get to whether these 
tactics um, that were used, whether these strategies that were used in the 60s still have relevance. You know, I think they do. But that's for us to prove. Well, Clay, one of my joys is to for when people, young people see this film and for them to see the young people, young children in Birmingham, for them to see other young people, to know that this, that young people have been involved in all struggles and that there's a role for them, that they can't just sit around and 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 moan about what's going on now. But yes, there are different tactics, but there's a role for all of us. And I think about many of the young people, for example, Lucas Johnson, who went with us to uh, Palestine. I think about young people who have been further encouraged to be involved. And Lucas carries on with the On Being project. And I always like to see how people will respond to the film and think about how they can be involved, how it impacts them and whether it's in uh, some part of an organized protest, but I like to say that protest is not, protest is just a part of nonviolence. There are probably 99 other tactics or methods that you can be involved in, but what the film shows us so much is that there's still ongoing work to be done and that we can look at internally to see what is our role and what part of the work we will pick up to carry on. I think that's one of Dorothy's uh, strengths, that sh this film can inspire you. You see this young girl from Goldsboro, North Carolina, who was not from uh, a family that gave her everything. And she went to ordinary HBCUs and she continued to grow throughout her life to become this great leader in this country and to be a person who was concerned about justice and peace and equality of all people so that she would go to Vietnam and that she would continue to, to encourage people to be a part of the change. That to me is a real strength of her life. And also, if I must say, the role of women that we don't know very much about that we, once we start learning about Dorothy, then we can remember that there were so many other women, important women who were involved in the in struggle and always have been. And many of the SNCC women, I think about uh, Dory Ladner who died recently, who was a member of, SLIT, of SNCC and um, her sister, um, Joyce, and uh, so many of the other people. So I think when we start studying the life of Dorothy and we realize that we didn't know very much about Dorothy, then we may be encouraged to say, oh, who else is it that I don't know much about? And take on some of the individual research to learn more about women who've been involved in leadership and social change. I would like to um, have just one question as we begin to start winding down a little bit. I do appreciate the, the women in the movement, the strength of Dorothy, um, the embodiment of love, the embodiment of nonviolence. What I would love to talk about just for a little bit, though, is joyful struggle. Because one of the things that that you know the story about uh, the car and with that Andy Young story gets bigger every time and and the laughter with so much of the joy of being in the beloved community and in struggle with each other is is lost. So I'd love for you to talk a little bit about about that as we wind ourselves down. Let me mention one thing that I heard from my late husband, Vincent Harding, and from Dorothy, that they talk about Dorothy coming to Mennonite House in Atlanta in the early 60s, as she was coming to Mennonite House was set up for respite and sanctuary for people who were in active, dangerous situations and were emotionally and physically often ab ab abused. And Dorothy came there and I think spent about a week of time just to rest and to sing and to eat and to talk. And so there are all those parts of movement to be in community with brothers and sisters that you could talk to and you're, tell your stories. And you may tell this really scary, life-changing uh, story 
but you would laugh about it since you were still there alive and just commune with one another over a meal or over some singing. And those are some of the things that allowed people having places like Mennonite House in Atlanta to find sanctuary, to continue to be. I'm thinking about, um, first of all, I want to acknowledge um, you, Clay, because one of the blessings of our trip to the West Bank was that you knew a lot of people over there already. You had been there. You had had a play produced, what was it Martin Luther King in, in Palestine? Was that what it was called? Yeah. Using Palestinian actors and a, an incredible Black choir in concert with each other to tell a story about Martin Luther King. So when we went there, we weren't just met by strangers. There were people who who knew Clay, who Clay could call on. And a lot of the people that you um, have, I'm going to say, nurtured as a professor um, are some of the young people who went with us. So I think of Osajifo Sekou and Lucas Johnson, but also when we were there, uh, Fadi Karan and, and Irene Nasser and, you know, there were Ramzi, Ramzi, uh, Makdisi, Ramzi Makdisi, people who you had already cultivated relationship with who were like, yeah, you're coming? Of course I'm going to be there and I'll get on the bus with you, travel to these places with you. That relationship building is something also, Al Josie, that I, you've heard me say this before. Vincent and you, when you came to Ithaca and you were talking to the teenagers upstairs in the teen lounge at, at the Greater Ithaca Activity Center, and one young man said, well, listening to all this stuff about the 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 civil rights movement getting thrown in jail and how violent. He said, weren't you afraid? And Vincent said, I hope you'll forgive me for saying this. Vincent said, I was so I was so scared I almost peed my pants. But I never did anything alone. I had my partners. We never went anywhere alone. And if I got scared, I would at, at a, in a march I didn't have to be at the front of the march. I could drop back and somebody else would come forward and march in the front until I got my nerve back. So that was one of the strengths of the movement. You didn't do anything alone. You had partnership and those partnerships had to be strong and um, serious partnerships because you were walking into danger. How are you gonna maintain your nerve when there are police and with dogs on, on either side of you? You're walking into something that is inherently, honest to God, is very dangerous, and yet you don't want to run away. So having numbers, having people with you and having them sing, that's got to help you maintain you know, a brave heart. And Clay, I think I got a lot of that from, from seeing how quietly and meaningfully you relate to the younger people. And I've, I've met some of your students and how incredible they are. You know, it's it, it's a it's a gift when you really believe that young people aren't just smart, but are courageous, innovative, creative, and the, the way that this planet is going to survive. And everybody on this call knows something about this. Al Josie knows about this, you know, brilliant at honoring young people sincerely, not just as a re as rhetoric. And Dorothy could do that. Um, one, one of the people I would I would mention, Laura, was uh, Jenna. I think some of you met her, but um, in one of the cities, little that girl, was, a little girl. She was I think six years old at that time. Uh, blonde hair. Um, she would she would be leading the march and and sometimes holding her younger sister and. Um, just yes, just this week, I was doing a Zoom session with my students in the King Freedom Center, and I was talking about it because I had some pictures of her, and I said, "Did you know that that young girl? Something about her life since then, she made the mistake of of picking a soldier and spent time in prison." Um. For, for that crime. But 
she also went on to become a journalist. You can go on online and find her journalism. She's written a memoir of her life. Um, you know, so you, you see both sides of it, how much, um, you know, the, there are people I've met who were no longer with us. You know, you mentioned the director of the theater who was assassinated when we were there. Yes. Uh, but there were other people who have gone on to live fruitful lives. They're still, I still try to stay in touch with them. I still try to find out as much as I can about what's going on. And this is one of 26 countries that I've been to. So there's there's a lot of people in all of these countries who are very much involved in the story we're telling. And um, I think that that's, that's something that, you know, your center, the center we created out here at Stanford, we always think of ourselves as, as a kind of part of a global network. Yes. Uh, yeah. um, and that's that's been the goal of, of bringing them all together. You know, we first we had a Gandhi King conference, remember? Mm -hmm. uh, some of you might have gone. Um, but more recently, we had a Gandhi King Mandela conference. Mm -hmm. And we'll just keep adding names and, and having more conferences to bring together people who are part of these struggles all over the world. Thank and the, so the, the the civil rights struggle is not over, but it's expanded to be a human rights struggle. And mm -hmm. I love what you said, Clay, about human rights are not something that you have because you live in a particular state or nation. Right. They they are because we are humans. These are our rights. And the 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 trick is how do we actually express them and protect them and manifest them because yes. they're always somebody's always trying to take it away from from us right. there's a quote from dorothy that said you know we 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 knew that our rights really we we knew how powerful our rights are if they're willing to try to kill us to take to keep us from voting that must mean voting is really important and i i i love that that reflection you know uh, people will will have to go into some dangerous situations, but you don't do it alone, and the relationships keep us going. Yeah, that is such a wonderful way for us to begin to start closing. I just want to encourage um, folks that have been listening to this powerful conversation to join us in the discussion after um, the link has been placed in the chat and that you popped in, but I did mention to Al Josie and to Laura, we have one minute, so 20 seconds a piece. Uh, you know, I talked about um, Dor the, the Dorothy whisperer. Let us just pause and hear the breath of the ancestor and, uh, and speak into this space and into our lives. What would Dorothy be telling us in this moment? as we sit right here wanting justice in the world, wanting human rights to be manifest globally, what would Dorothy be telling us? And we will use that as our closing statement. I got one. Go. For it. It's in the movie. Think of yourself as someone who can change a situation. That was the essence. Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, Dorothy, I wasn't going to use Dorothy's language exactly, but that's exactly what I believe in. And to say to people that you are the ones that we have been waiting for. Um, as long as we're alive, the struggle is not going to be over. Mm -hmm. Thank you all so very much for this amazing conversation. And, uh, and that I'll turn it back to you. Well, thank you, Charlene, for your amazing moderating of this incredible panel. Laura Branca, Al Josie, Aldrich Harding, Claiborne Carson, thank you so much for being a part of this. We look forward to seeing all of you on August 28th, when we'll host people who knew and loved Mr. Bayard Rustin, the architect of the 1963 March on Washington. We hope to see you then. In the meantime, have a great summer.